Um, when I was a director of youth ministry in um, Texas, there was a girl that was in our youth group. She was probably, I don't know, maybe 11, 12 years old, and she was the opposite of talkative, okay? She was really quiet to the point of, like, irritating, um, and so there was, like, it was you just, like, pulling teeth trying to get words out of her, and so there came a point where I used her name as like a verb whenever I would describe people who would not like participate in conversations. So my wife and I um, drove her home after a youth group one, you know, one day. And as we're driving, like there, you know, she's in the car with us and we would ask questions, you know, like, Hey, did, did you like youth group? What'd you think of it? You know? And she would go, it's good. You know? And then you'd say, well, like, what was your favorite part? And she'd be like, all of it. And then you're like, okay, so when we drop you off with your family, like, you know, tell me about them. They're good. You know, and she just wouldn't, she wouldn't let the conversation go anywhere. And so there were times where I would use her name. I'm going to make up a name. I won't tell you her real name, but I'll make up a name. Isabella, let's call her that. There are times in the years that followed that I would use her name, like, to describe that, that I would be in some situation, then I would go up to Heidi and she'd go, how did that go? And I'd be like, oh no, they totally Isabella to me the whole time. Like, I just, there was nothing to say. So... This um, week, I went online and I went to the website of that church that I used to be on staff at. This would have been like almost 20 years ago. I went onto their website and this is what I found out. First of all, she still goes there, okay? She's like in her 30s now. And she is the coordinator of the children's ministry of the church. Like she's their children's minister, and okay? Like, I, and I bet you she talks now. I'm almost certain <laughs> she does. And it was just, you know, I don't know. It was fantastic to see what has changed in the meantime. And when I think about that, I don't, I'm sure you know this, 2,000 years ago, they were unable to do that. Did you know that? Right? Like in the New Testament era, they did not have the ability to like live in some place like I did in Texas and minister and share the gospel and, you know, talk to people and then move to some other place like I did when I moved to Florida and then check and see, well, how's it going back where I was? Like, they couldn't go on Facebook and see how people were doing. They couldn't go on church websites and see what was going on. Like, the main way that if they had went far away and they were like, I wonder how the churches are doing. I wonder how these Christians are doing. I wonder how these people that I used to minister to or minister with, I wonder how they're doing. The main way they had to be able to go check, you want to know what it was? You want to guess? Yeah, they had to go there. Like, they should, they should travel back to wherever they were and had to see what it was like. So if there were people like Paul and Barnabas who went around the island of Cyprus and went around Galatia and they talked to these people and they taught them about Jesus and then they went back home and they started wondering, well, I wonder how's it, how it's going in, in the churches. I wonder if they still believe. I wonder if false teaching has crept in. I wonder who the leaders are now. The main way that they had to check that out was to just travel back again and visit the people. And that brings us to our next passage in our series, Life of Paul. So here we are, Life of Paul, series two, part three, and we are going to pick up right where we left off in Acts chapter 15, verse 36. So if you have your Bible, go to Acts chapter 15, verse 36. The verse just before verse 36, which was the last one we read last week, was, but Paul and Barnabas, along with many others, remained in Antioch, teaching and proclaiming the message of the Lord. That's how we ended the story. There they are in Antioch after they settled the whole circumcision thing, and there they are being pastors and preaching and teaching the word of God. And then... This happens, verse 36. After some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in every town where we have preached the message of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark, but Paul did not think it appropriate to take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to the work. There was such a sharp disagreement that they parted company and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. Then Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended to the grace of the Lord by the brothers. He traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So that's our passage for this morning. And you see how it begins is how I described it, right? That they can't go on Facebook and they can't go and check and see how things are going with the brothers. Though they decide, let's go on a trip. And as they discuss this potential trip that they're going to go on, what happens? something incredible happens, right? I mean, this is a wow passage. There are very few 
Bible passages like this one. There are very few Bible stories that involve like two church heroes disagreeing like this. And I call them church heroes. I don't think that's an exaggeration. For those of you who were here last week, remember how the church in Jerusalem wrote a letter that was commending Paul and Barnabas? That letter said, um, it said, we're sending these men along, along with our beloved Paul and our beloved Barnabas and Paul who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like the Jerusalem church, the mothership had just written a letter talking about how loved they are and how they risked their lives for Jesus. I mean, these were heroes of the church. And now we read in a story, in fact, the very next story, that they now have this disunity that separates their ministry. So what I want to do this morning is I'd, I'd like to dive into the story and tell it and talk about what it says and what do the verses teach us. And I'd even like to fill in extra details of like other Bible passages that took place like before this and after this, other Bible passages that will inform this one and help us to be able to better picture what was going on. And then after that, at the end of the sermon, I would like to share a, a helpful principle with you like, and an exhortation for, for our lives. So let's start with the story, going to verse 36. This is how it begins. After some time had passed. So what had been happening in the meantime? The verse before this said they were there in Antioch teaching and preaching, right? So they were just doing their normal, they're in their hometown, doing their normal ministry, and they had been doing it for some time. And then Paul got a great idea. Paul says, hey, Barnabas, don't you want to know what's going on with all those churches? Don't you want to know if they're still believing? Don't you want to know what's, what's up with them? Why don't we go and do that trip again? Why don't we go visit all those brothers and see what's going on? And obviously, from the way the story is written, Barnabas thought it was a great idea. There was no disunity as to whether they ought to go or not. Barnabas seemed to be like, sure, that sounds great. The issue is verse 37. This is where the disagreement began. Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark. Why is that a problem? Who's John Mark and what's the big deal about this? Why, why did this become an issue? And so what we need to do is we need to go back to Acts chapter 13, verse 13, where we last saw this fellow. He, is, he was in the story, but we learned this weeks and weeks ago. So I don't know if you remember it or not, but we're going to go back to Acts chapter 13, verse 13, and see what was it that we were told happened last time? Because last time they went on a mission Jerry journey, um, there were three guys that left, but only two that came back. It was Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark that went off on the trip. And then John Mark left partway through and gave up. And so only Paul and Barnabas made it back to Antioch at the end of the trip. Well, how did that go down? What's the story? Here's the story. Luke chapter 13, or sorry, Acts chapter 13. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13, verse 13. He says, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylian. John, however, left them and went back to Jerusalem. That's it. That's the story. That's what Luke tells us happened back then. And there's not much to it. And in fact, at the time that I taught you this, I think I said at the time, I said, ooh, this is going to be a big deal later, okay? Even though it doesn't seem like a big deal now. Well, it's later, and here we are. It turns out that this was a big deal, but you wouldn't know it from the way Luke records it, would you? It just seems like, like Luke doesn't record a lot of details. Obviously, more happened than what is shown here, right? They set sail, they show up over here in Pamphylia, and John left them and went back to Jerusalem. I assume he got on a boat and went back to Jerusalem while they had this like mountains to climb as they were heading deeper into Galatian territory. And if all we had were Acts chapter 13, verse 13, all we have is Luke's version of it, which is just very sparse, not just, just the facts, no commentary, whether this was good or bad or, or, or what they discussed, right? Um, you, you could, you, if all we had was just Acts 13, 13, we'd have to wonder like, was this like a, a good left them or a bad left them, right? Is this like he abandoned them or is this like he was done with his time? Is this, I mean, was, was this a point where he was like, man, I am so tired of you two and I don't want to minister you anymore and I don't even agree with what we're doing and we're telling the Gentiles that they don't have to obey all the laws of Moses and, you know, and I just I have to carry all this equipment and we're walking, walking, walking. I'm just tired of the whole thing. I'm done with you guys. And did Paul and Barnabas say to him, like, well, no, no, dude, you can't skip in the middle. Like, this is this, we're, we're together on this trip, right? And we're all carrying, we're walking from city to city with our tents and our food and all of our stuff. And if you get on the boat and leave now, we've got to carry all our stuff plus your stuff all the way to Antioch and Pisidia. And like, you can't, you're going to make this harder for us than if you'd not shown up at all. Maybe he said, I don't even care what you think anymore, you know, and he got on the boat and left. I don't, it could have been something bad like that. 
Because we don't know. Or maybe it was good. Maybe if, if all we knew were this verse, maybe it was a good parting. Maybe they got to the city and he said, man, I'm sick. I have felt sick for like two weeks now. I just feel like I'm not getting better. I can't get any sleep, like sleeping outdoors like this. I just want to go home to my bed and get recover. And maybe Paul and Barnabas went, hey, that's fine. You know, honorable discharge. You know, you did as best you could. That could have been how it was, right? Well, if this is the only verse we had, we could think maybe that's how it could be how it was, but we don't. By the time you get to chapter 15, you find like, that didn't happen. That, what, the last thing I just described, that's not what happened. No, the reason that he left was a bad reason, and you can tell that from verse 38 of chapter 15. So let's go back to our story. Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark, but here's verse 38. Paul did not think it appropriate to take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to the work. The reason that John Mark left them was a bad reason. Or at the very least, you could say, Paul thought it was a bad reason. Whatever reason it was that John Mark left, Paul thought that is not a good enough reason to quit. So now we know John Mark's leaving was not for a good reason, at least in Paul's opinion. And then we bring, that brings us to verse 39, the disagreement. Verse 39 says, there was such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. And so what I want to do now is, again, point out that there's not a lot of commentary here. Luke does not give us the script of what Barnabas and Paul said to each other. We don't know if this sharp disagreement was over the course of five days or five minutes. We don't know if they were screaming at each other or if they were being real civil. We don't know. But what I want to do is I, I think it'd be helpful if we can sort of picture what happened. And I think one way that we can better picture what happened is if you would let me fill you in on a few other Bible stories that give us some insight into these guys' personality, that they parted ways. Like, there are other Bible stories that give us some hints as to what Paul and Barnabas were like when they had to handle tough situations or disagreements or arguments. So let me tell you just a little bit about these guys' personalities so you can picture. First of all, let's talk about Paul's personality. Okay, I don't know if you know much about Paul's personality, but I'm, I'm going just, to just give you two Bible passages that I think maybe shed some light onto the kind of man he was. Specifically, these are ones about how he handles disagreement. Like, how does he handle when, like, you know, he thinks he's right and someone else is wrong, right? How does he handle, like, conflict? So I'm going to show you, and this is his own words. I'm going to read to you from Galatians. This is not a story someone wrote about him. This is what he said in the book of Galatians when he told the story of the time he disagreed with Peter. Okay, he had a disagreement with Peter, although in this story he's called Cephas, um, which is the same thing as Peter, but I'll call him Cephas since that's the story. He has this argument with a guy named Cephas, and he tells the story from his point of view, and here it is, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. That's not a third-party person describing the situation. This is Paul telling the story from his perspective. Yeah, he showed up and I opposed him. He walked up and I was like, ha ha, you're wrong, right? I opposed him to his face. I didn't gossip about him. I just went right up to him and told him he was wrong. That's how he handled his disagreement with Peter. And, this, and the paragraph goes on. If you read the rest of Galatians, you'll see he did it in front of everyone. Like there was a whole bunch of people around and he was like, you're wrong, right? And he said it in front of everybody. So that's how he handled that particular disagreement. Let me show you one other one. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 18. So this is a letter written to Timothy, and it says, Timothy, my son, this is like his apprentice in the ministry. He says, Timothy, my son, I am giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you, so that by them you may strongly engage in, what's the word? Battle. That's an interesting word. It's a metaphor, right? Paul is not speaking to a soldier, telling him how to handle an actual battle, right? He's not talking to someone in the military. He's talking to a fellow pastor, and he's saying, I'm trying to show you how to battle. Like, that's what Paul thought they were doing. Like, we're, we're, what are we doing for Jesus? We're in a war. I'm, I'm showing you how to battle for Jesus, Timothy, right? I want you to strongly engage in battle, having faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and have suffered the shipwreck of their faith. Hymenaeus and Alexander are among them, and I have delivered them to Satan so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. So as he's talking to Timothy, he's saying, here's the pastoral work. It is a battle, right? And we need to make sure that people aren't shepherding their faith like Hymenaeus and Alexander. Remember that story? Remember when that happened? And I delivered them to Satan? What does that even mean? That he was like, here, Satan. Like, what does that mean? Well, if you look at some of the other letters, particularly 1 Corinthians, you'll see that, that that little phrase almost certainly means excommunicated them, right? That they were part of the church, 
They're part of the kingdom of God. Now we are handing them over. We are kicking them out of the church. We are putting them over in Satan land, right? We are, we are excommunicating them from the church so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. And so when I look at these passages that are written by Paul about how he handled these issues, I mean, it's fair to say that this was an assertive guy, right? Okay, maybe aggressive. I don't know what the right word is to use, but I'll just, let's go with assertive, right? I opposed him to his face. I handed him over to Satan. We got to battle this out. Now, what do we know about Barnabas? What do we know about his personality? Well, we know less about Barnabas than we do Paul's personality. At least we have less of his writings. But let's look at what we know. Uh, going to Acts chapter 4 in particular. I want to start there. Acts chapter 4 is the, the first appearance of Barnabas, at least as far as I know. I think the first time that Barnabas appears in the Bible is Acts chapter 4, verse 36. And it's interesting because when we get there, we find out his name is not even Barnabas. Okay? Acts chapter 4, verse 36 says this. I think this is the first time Barnabas shows up. Joseph, that's his actual name, Joseph, a Levite and a Cypriot by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement, sold a field he owed, owned and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so that's our first appearance of Barnabas. What's he like? Well, first of all, he is a generous person, right? He sold what he had and he gave it to the church. We see that he has a name, a real name, Joseph, but they all called him Barnabas. Why did they call him Barnabas? Well, I assume, like Luke says, it is translated son of encouragement for a reason. They called him Barnabas because of what that word means, right? This guy, I'm guessing, had such a strong personality that when they talked to him, they didn't even call him by his name. They called him by his character quality, right? Now, I don't know exactly what it was about him that got, got him that name because there's, like, there's I guess there's semantic range into what this word means and how it can be translated. It could be son of exhortation or son of uh, consolation or son of encouragement. It's a word that can mean someone who encourages people or someone who uh, like teaches people and, or, or someone who consoles people, like comforts them when they're having a, a rough time. So I don't know exactly what Barnabas did. I don't know if he was good at comforting sad people or good at cheering people up or good at instructing people in the Bible. But, but, but there's some character quality that was so strong in him that they called him that rather than his name. Now, I won't do too much about his name because let's go and look at his actions. Because a few chapters later, we see Barnabas do something that I think matches with what else we know about him. It probably speaks volumes as to what this guy's like. Acts chapter 9 is the next verse I want to read. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. So here is the son of encouragement, and um, Acts 26. Now it says, when he arrived in Jerusalem, okay, the he in this verse is Paul. But in, at this point of the story, he's going by the name Saul, okay? The story calls him Saul at this point. Saul arrived in Jerusalem, and what happened in this point, and this is, this is you could picture this happening, Saul was like a really bad dude. Like he was, he was, before he became a Christian, he was a persecutor of the Christian church, He was going around and throwing them in jail. He was going around and imprisoning them. He was going around and he's happy when they would die. People would stone Christians to death and he'd be like, right on. Like he was this, he was the worst persecutor of the Christian church at this point in this city. And all of the Christians were afraid of him. They were all afraid of him. He he would, if if, if you're a Christian in Jerusalem and Saul comes and knocks on your door, you run out the back door like drug dealers when cops show up, right? That's what they were doing. And so when he showed up, and, and he, had, he had just become a Christian. And he shows up and goes, hey, everyone, I'm a Christian now. Don't worry, I don't want to hurt you. I'm one of you. And all of the Christians went, <laughs> yeah, right. And they all, they all hid, and all of them were scared of him, and none of them would talk to him. They wouldn't get within 10 feet of him. And he's like, no, for real, I'm changed. And they're like, yeah, I'm not going to risk it. No, thanks, you know? And when he's sitting there knocking on the door, they're going like, just let him keep knocking. Like, this isn't, we don't talk to him. He kills people. He throws us in jail. Yeah, but he says he's a Christian. Yeah, that's not hard to say. I'm a Christian. I know he says it. This guy's awful. Do not trust this guy. We know what he's done. So that's what's going on here. So when he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him since they did not believe he was a disciple right? None of the Christians would associate with him. None of them would talk. He was sitting there. He's trying to make friends. They were like, no, thank you. Except there was one Christian in town that would give him a second chance. There was one Christian that would say, let's hear what he has to say. And who was it? Barnabas. Barnabas, however, however, meaning in contrast to all the other Christians in town, Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles. 
They must have loved that, right? Here's Saul. Oh, no, that's not the gift we were hoping for for Pastor Appreciation Day. And we don't want Saul. Why did you bring Saul? Go bring something else better, right? No, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them. Barnabas explained to them, right? Because they're not going to listen to Saul. They don't care about a word he has to say. Barnabas explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. And the reason that Barnabas... I'm um, sorry, the reason that Saul was able to initially associate with the apostles and the earliest disciples of Jesus is because Barnabas was the one that was able to look past his past and was to say, let's give him a second chance. And he took him under his wing and he brought him in. One more thing about Barnabas, and this is just a short thing, but I, th- I think it's very possible that this could have factored in, and so I want to throw it in. Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, is a verse that says, let me find it here. Okay, never mind, it's going to come up. Um, chapter 4, verse 10 is a verse that talks about a guy named Mark, okay? I assume it's the same Mark, and it says, Mark, Barnabas' cousin. So it could be one of the reasons that Barnabas was, like, eager to forgive and let's give him a second chance. It could very well be because it's one of his relatives, okay? So with all that in mind, okay, let's go back now to Acts chapter 15, verse 39. Now that we know all of these things about, we've read Paul's words, we've read stories about Barnabas, okay, now we've looked at all this stuff. And we realized there was such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. <laughs> now, knowing what you know now, can you better picture how this conversation went down? Because I can. I could totally picture how this went down. You've got to picture Mr. Assertive versus Mr. Encouragement. Okay? Like Mr. Like justice and this is the right way, okay? Versus Mr. Come on, he's my cousin, right? You've got Mr. Black and White versus Mr. Let's give him a second chance. And they're trying to decide what to do about John Mark. And I, could, I could picture the conversation. I could picture Paul says to Barnabas, hey, don't you want to go visit all the other churches and do the trip again and, and see how they're going? And I'm sure Barnabas went, that's a great idea. Let's redo the trip. I'll go get John Mark. Paul went, whoa, not what I was talking about. Why would you go get John Mark? I don't mean literally do everything we did the first time, including the stupid decisions we made the first time. I meant, like, let's go visit the people, right? Not John Mark. Do you, I mean, are you joking that you're even saying, let's go get John Mark? Is this like a funny, like, go get John Mark? He abandoned us halfway through. The whole experience was more difficult because of him. Why in the world would we bring him? You know, and Barnabas is getting there going, yeah, well, he apologized. Paul's going, he apologized to me, right? Barnabas said, well, he did to me. He told me to tell you. Yeah, well, he can tell me to my face, right? And Barnabas is going, come on, man, he's my cousin. I don't want to forsake him. And Paul's going, then don't forsake him. Take him with you on your next family vacation. This is a mission trip, right? This is business. This is God's kingdom. We're not going to mess it up, risking the same exact thing now that we know. And then Barnabas goes in for the clincher. He goes, Paul, or should I call you the name I first met you by? Saul, you have done way worse than John Mark. Goodness gracious. Remember when, I, remember when I met you, what your reputation was? Remember how everyone judged you for your past? Remember how there was nobody willing to give you a second chance, and then I came along and I said, come on, let's give him a second chance. And that's how you got in? Do you remember that? Paul, please. What, what was done for you you now have the opportunity to do for someone else. I could picture Paul going, hmm, has a good speech. No. Because <laughs> this is a totally different situation than that. This is not the same thing. We don't do the same thing here because that's not the same thing as that. I mean, I don't know what they said, but don't you think it was something like that? So, verse 39. There was such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. And then I want you to see the map of what happens next. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. Then Paul chose Silas. And uh, come and give me some verses. Yeah. Then Paul chose Silas. Now, remember from last week, Silas was one of the two eyewitnesses that came with them up to Antioch in order to verify that the letter was true. Okay, same guy. So um, Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended to the grace of God. I'm sorry, to the grace of the Lord by the brothers, he traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So what we see is here they are in Antioch, and what Barnabas and John Mark do is they do the same thing that happened last time. Now I'll take the whole map. They do the same thing they did last time. So if you remember from earlier in the series, the red line is the first missionary trip, okay? They went this way, through this island, up into this region. The blue line is the return trip, went back to the same cities, but then skipped this island and went over here. 
And so that was what they did the first time around. So Barnabas and uh, John Mark continue the same kind of trip. And they go and visit, apparently, the southern cities out of the cities that were visited during this trip. Silas and Paul, however, realize there is another way to get there other than going through by sea. We can climb these mountains and we can go over here and we can visit them by going on foot. So Silas and Paul go up to the northern cities that they had visited and John Mark and Barnabas go to the southern cities. And so there are now two missionary teams. Perhaps you could say they are like, cover, like doubling the ground that they're covering, maybe ministering twice as much, right, with two teams going out. So here's the question. Who was right? It's one of the most famous arguments in the Bible, okay? Who was correct? Who was wrong? And what's interesting, and I think Christians have noticed this for 2,000 years now, Luke doesn't say. Luke doesn't say who was wrong. And it seems to me he easily could have, right? He could have. Luke doesn't say that Barnabas' standards were too low. Luke doesn't say that Paul's standards were too high. Luke does not say that Paul was bitter and unforgiving. Luke does not say that Barnabas was foolish and naive. And so what I'm thinking is, probably one of two things is possible. Either it's not important which one of them was wrong. Like Luke didn't think that's the important thing to establish with this story, right? It's either, it's, it either doesn't matter which one of them was wrong, or maybe it's possible that neither one of them was wrong. That this is one of those places where two Christians just disagree on how to do something. That it wasn't a moral issue. That it wasn't one of them was saying adultery is a sin and the other one's going, no, I think it's fine. Right? That's the kind of thing that Luke probably would have been like, I think I've got to tell the readers who was right about that. But in this case, one of them thought John Mark was qualified and the other one thought he wasn't. Maybe it wasn't a moral issue. One of them just said, I don't, I don't feel comfortable doing it that way. And the other one said, I don't feel comfortable doing it that way. Well, I guess we're going to do it two different ways. Now, one thing that I thought would be interesting and perhaps helpful to point out is it seems that something happened after this story, and we don't know what the thing was that took place, but it seems that something took place that, caught, that, that we could say later on in the story that Paul and John Mark eventually reconciled. Okay, I think Paul and John Mark eventually reconciled. We don't know the details of it, but I think we know that it happened. At least I think we know it's very likely, and we can know that from the later writings of Paul, things that he wrote after the story happened. I'm going to show you two of them. One is a verse we already looked at from Colossians. Let me show it to you one more time. This is Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. This is at the end of the letter. And if you don't know this, what Paul often does when he writes letters is he writes all this wonderful spiritual stuff. And then when you get to the, like the last chapter or the last half of the last chapter, he does the like, so-and-so says hi, like the personal stuff at the end of the letter. And so this is what he says at the end of Colossians. He says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. Right? So there's Paul, and he's writing to the Colossians. He's like, oh, just Aristarchus, you know him, right? He says hi. And look at this. As does Mark, Barnabas' cousin. So, assuming this is the same Mark, right? <laughs> he is saying what? I mean, I, do you get where I'm, where I'm going with this? He's telling the Colossians, Mark says hi. Which means what? It means Mark's with him when he writes this. He's hanging out with Mark at this point and saying Mark extends his greetings. He's ministering with Mark when he writes this. All right, I mean, he doesn't explain who this Mark is, so I'm kind of assuming it's the only one we know about, right? Barnabas' cousin. Concerning whom you have received instructions, which is really interesting. I mean, you know there's a whole story behind that. I don't know the story. I, I, don't, I, I mean, that's, this is all we got. But you know, so the fact that he would say, Mark says hi, the one that's Barnabas' cousin, the one that you've received special instructions about, like what did this guy do that the Colossians got special instructions about him? I don't know. Maybe there was a part where they were warned not to associate with him. Maybe there was a point where they weren't associating with him and he's saying, no, the guy has repented, you need, to, you need to welcome him. I don't know what the instructions were, but notice what he says here. He says, if he comes to you, welcome him, which almost seems to assume that maybe the Colossians wouldn't have, but then Paul says, no, you need to accept him, which is very ironic, right? Colossians, you need to accept him. Wait, the guy that Paul would not accept in Acts 15? Yeah, him, welcome him. What does that mean? I don't know. I mean, I guess, it, I guess it could mean Paul's the most, like the biggest hypocrite in the whole Bible, but it also could mean, and this is what I think is more likely, something took place between Acts 15 and when Colossians was written, and those two guys made up. They reconciled. Here's another one that I think points toward that, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
Second, again, this is at the end of the letter, per, the personal stuff. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. What? Paul said, bring Mark. He's talking to Timothy here. Bring Mark with you. He's useful to me in ministry. The Mark that you thought was definitely not useful to you in Acts 15? Yeah, that Mark. Things have changed. At least that's what I think. I think that's the most likely way to assume this. I assume it's the same Mark. And something had changed. Bring him with me. Bring him with you. He is useful to me in the ministry. So that's the story. That's our Bible story for this morning. And I guess I wanted to ask this question. What can we learn from this story? Like we in this room in the year 2022, what can we learn from this story? Probably a lot. We can learn from this story that Christians can disagree. Right? Christians can be in conflict with one another and disagree about things. If we factor in other passages, like I did this morning, we could, we could talk about how Christians can disagree and reconcile. I think you could preach a sermon on this where someone talks about how God can use disagreements in order to double the amount of missionary work being done. In fact, I'm pretty sure there have been pastors who have preached that on this passage. But here's the thing that I wanted to share with you today. I hope it's helpful. It was something that I sort of had to preach to myself, and then I figured I would share it with you all. This is what I got out of the passage. I wanted to end with this. In fact, will you put the little phrase up for me? This is what I think, uh, uh, this is what I want to share with you. Sometimes serving God is messy, but the alternative is worse. So when I look at this passage and I see what Paul and Barnabas were doing, I can't help but tell you this. Sometimes serving God is messy. Sometimes it's relational messy and there's drama and there's problems and there's conflict and somebody says, this is my opinion and someone says, that's not what the Bible says. Like sometimes serving God is messy. You need to know that. But I think you also need to know the alternative is worse. The alternative meaning not serving God. I think it's easy to come across a passage like this and sort of give Paul and Barnabas a hard time for disagreeing. You know, well, one of them should have just been humble and given up and whatever, right? But I want you to notice that part of the reason that Paul and Barnabas were disagreeing in this passage is because they were serving God. And they were serving God in unprecedented ways. There were very few Christians at this time that, <laughs> that cared about all of the Gentiles over in Lystra and Derby and them knowing about Jesus. But Paul and Barnabas did. And so they were willing to do something, they were willing to do a certain type of serving God that was different than what a lot of other Christians were doing. But in doing that, they opened themselves up. And in doing a kind of ministry that had never been done before, they opened themselves up to, well, who's qualified to do this and who should come and how should we do it? I guess what I'm saying is this you can avoid many conflicts by just not serving God. Like God calls you to serve him. And there are times when you serve him in such a way that when you do the right thing, it, it ticks somebody off. Or you, do, or you say, well, this is what I believe. And then the other person is all upset at you for saying that that's what you believe. Or you, whatever the situation is, but you do what, what you believe is the right thing. And it causes these conflicts. And if you weren't serving God at all, that mess wouldn't even be in your life. You can avoid all sorts of conflicts by just not serving God. I mean, let me give you a great example for how it works at this church. Okay? Would you like to avoid all, any and all conflicts at Good News Church. You want to make sure that your relationship with this church involves that you are not ever involved in anybody else's relational mess, anybody else's drama, no conflict. You want to guarantee that. I can tell you how to do it. I can tell you how you can make that happen. You're not going to have any conflicts anymore at this church. You want to know how you do it? Don't get involved. Don't get involved. Don't volunteer in Kids Zone. Don't volunteer to be a youth leader. Don't volunteer to be in the band. Don't help, help out back there. Don't, don't lead a community group. Oh my goodness, don't lead a community group. <laughs> don't even join a community group. Ugh, don't, do, no, no. If you want to have no drama, do not join a community group. They're filled with people, okay? They're filled with people, some of whom disagree with you and have different opinions than you on things. And some of who agree with you and are just irritating. Have you ever had that happen? Where you're like, the guy's, you're like, man, I'm on his side and I want to punch him, Right? <laughs> No, if you want to, if you want to be like, if you want to call this your church, but not ever get involved in any relational messes, come five minutes late every week. Show up, like, leave one minute before it's done every week. And during intermission, go to the bathroom the whole time. And this is what I'm saying. 
Sometimes serving God is messy, but the alternative is worse. You can avoid people and avoid all sorts of conflicts. That's not better. That's not better for you. Not getting involved is not better for you. Let me, let me explain this. I'm going to talk about it from my point of view and just tell you a little bit about my story, and then I'll talk about it from, from your point of view. As far as my story goes, I was thinking about this this week, and I guess I'll just confess to you. There are times when I, because of the nature of what I do, get involved in ministry that creates, like there's, there's, there's relational conflicts and there's messes and there's drama and I hate it and I hate that someone's offended at so-and-so and they're offended that I didn't get mad at so-and-so when they did or they're upset that I said what I said or whatever it may be. And there are times when it's, it's I don't know, like it's, it's dramatic enough, enough conflict that, that I just, I hate it, I hate it. I hate it when people don't like me. I hate it when people are frustrated at me. And there are times when I've been tempted to quit. There are times when I've thought to myself, and I don't remember when I first realized this, but I, there's times when I thought to myself, you know, it seems to me that most of the messes and the conflicts in my life are related to my ministry. They're not part of my personal life. When I think of like the list of people who hate me, which is not like super long, but it exists, okay? And when I think about the list of people who hate me, almost everyone on that list is related to ministry stuff, not my personal life. Maybe one dude from my personal life, but almost all the rest is because I'm in a particular position where the way that I serve God involves me making decisions, and sometimes I make like programming decisions that people don't like, or I make staffing decisions that people don't like, or I, make some, I communicate something that people don't like, or they don't like the way I said it, or they don't like that I said, this is what the Bible's position is, and they go, well, that's not what I think. I've had to fire volunteers before. Ooh, I remember the first time I had to fire a volunteer. I was a youth ministry director in Texas. I was in my 20s, and there was this woman youth leader, and she kept breaking the rules, breaking the rules, breaking the rules, and I kept warning her and warning her, and finally there was the day where I fired her. And so we just we sat down in my office. Heidi was there. She sat across, I think, the desk from me, if I remember right, and I explained the whole thing, and the, that was your last shot. Like, you're not going to be a youth leader here anymore. And she started crying. And in my 20s, I'm sitting there, like, thinking, this is so awkward. Why do I have to be in the room? It's terrible. I mean, firing volunteers is rough. Because you you're, you're talking to them about something and they're looking at you, at least I think they're looking at you, going like, you're saying I'm worth l less than zero dollars an hour? I'm a volunteer and you're firing me? I'm, I'm worth less than nothing, right? And, and you're sitting there like looking at them like, yeah, that, that is what I'm saying. And it's hard, and they get offended, and then it's not just them. They get offended, their husband get offended, their wife get offended, their, their aunt and their uncle and their grandma and their kids are all mad at you. And sometimes it's tempting to quit. And then I have to say to myself, oh, sometimes serving God is messy, but the alternative is worse. Would it be better if I just stopped? Would it be better if I said, wow, I could find some job with very little human interaction? Would that be less messy? The answer is yes. I've thought about it. It is less messy. But is it better? Is that what's better for the kingdom of God? Is that what's better for God's will? Is that what's better for the way God created me? No, that's not better. So let me talk about you, because I bet you this is absolutely not unique to me. There are probably tons of you in this room that you've got your own story. There are some of you in this room that you had a conversation with somebody, and you felt like God was the one that was calling you to do it. You were serving God by having to tell them this thing, but the thing that you were supposed to tell them was something they didn't want to hear, and you knew they didn't want to hear it. But you also realized like damage was being done because nobody was saying anything, and other people's lives were even being affected, and you said, okay, fine, I'm going to tell them. And you prayed about it, and you prayed about it, and you prayed about it so that you'd have the right attitude, and you'd have the right tone, and you wouldn't come across as judgmental. Remember that? In fact, you prayed about it so much that you kind of got optimistic and thought, like, this is going to go so good. They're going to repent in ashes and dust and say, thank you so much. I'm going to change my whole life. And then you went in there, and that didn't happen at all. Your fantasy, like, just went away, and they got angry at you, and they never spoke to you again. Remember that? And it hurt. Like, relationally, that hurt. And some of you, even after that happened, you walked away and you went, well, I'm done doing that ever again. That was a waste of time. I don't <laughs> teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. <laughs> Mario can preach that all he wants. I'm not doing that anymore. Right? No, from now on, I'm not telling people what they don't want to hear. If someone comes up to me and goes, what do you think about that? I'm going to be like, what do you think about that? Oh, <laughs> same thing I believe, right? That's what I'm doing from now on. And what I'm saying to you is, listen, sometimes serving God is messy. 
Sometimes doing the right thing causes like drama and a person gets offended, right? But the alternative is worse. Are you really for the rest of your life never going to warn anyone? Like you're seeing them like slip off into the fire and you're going to say nothing? You're never going to do that again? Is that really what's best? There are some of you that have probably had to fire people. Maybe it was in an employment situation where you had to fire someone. Maybe it was in a, a volunteer position. Maybe it was a Christian nonprofit sort of thing. Maybe it was a, you know, a regular employment sort of thing. Maybe it wasn't even, you know, like it was just one of those situations where you said, I, I, you know, I've got to do something about this. Maybe it wasn't even firing. Maybe it was um, just like you turned down when they applied. When they said, can I help? You said no. But, but in saying no, they were like, well, who do you think you are? You know, or whatever happened. So you turned them down or you fired them or you did whatever. And you were in a situation where you were like thinking about what that individual person wanted you to do, and then you were weighing that out with what would be best for the whole group. And you did what you believed was God's will, and you were trying to serve God, and you did the right thing. And not only did they get upset at you, but their whole family all got upset at you. Right? Now you, they're dodging you at Walgreens whenever you see them, and it's like, you know, it's just, and you're going, man, this, this stinks, but I feel like I did the right thing. Some of you have probably in this room, you've cut someone out of your life because you were trying to obey Matthew chapter 18 or um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where you get to a point with someone in your life that they claim to be a Christian, but they keep sinning and they keep sinning. And finally you say to them, like, listen, if you keep claiming to be a believer and you will not let this go, like, I, if you won't repent, I'm not going to be hanging out with you anymore, right? I, I'm not going to know you anymore. And you did that because the Bible tells you to do it. And the person got so upset at you and they stormed off, and they told four or five of your mutual friends about it, and now none of those people will talk to you either. They won't talk to you. They will talk about you, about how graceless and judgmental you are, but they won't talk to you. And that hurts, and you were just trying to do the right thing. In fact, you were doing what the verse said to do. Some of you, it's the exact opposite of that. Some of you, it wasn't that you shunned someone, it's that you forgave someone, and forgiving someone ticked somebody else off. Right? And you, th th it was difficult for you to do, but you prayed about it and you realized they were repentant and you accepted them back into your life. And when you accepted them back into your life, someone said to you, how dare you forgive them? I will never forgive them and I won't forgive someone who forgives them. So if you accept them into your life, you're, the, I, I'm out of your life. I bet you there are people in this room that's happened to you and you're sitting there going, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I've, I've got to follow my Savior's lead on this and I've got to forgive but it hurt. Do you remember? And so I'm saying to all of you here, first of all, let me just say to you personally, I'm sorry that that happened. I understand. I empathize with you. It's happened to me too. But I will say to you the same thing I say to myself. Sometimes serving God is messy, but the alternative is worse. Don't give up. What if what if Paul and Barnabas had given up? What if they had said, like, this is all this relational drama and who's qualified to go on the trip and who's not? And you know what? Let's just go back to ministering in Antioch when we had, like, drama-free ministry. Let's just go back to that. Let's not do the stuff that's susceptible to conflict. Would that have been better? Not if you're a Gentile in Lystra, right? So I end by reminding you of the gospel. Jesus Christ died on the cross for sins. He died on the cross. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, he died on the cross for your sins. He died on the cross, cross to, to forgive you of your sins and to clean up the messes in your life from your sin and other people's messes, other people's sins. And he rose again, and he ascended to heaven, and he's coming back. And he says that when he comes back, he is preparing for us an eternity where there will be no more messes. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more conflict. There'll be no more relational drama. I guess what I'm telling you is, and this is, you need to know this from the Bible, serving God is messy for now, but it won't be messy forever. There will come a day where you will serve God for a million years in a row with no messes. So in the meantime, between now and then, we serve him now in the middle of the conflicts, in the middle of the messes, including the ones we cause with our own sin, until the day that he arrives and they are no more. Let's pray. 
God, we look forward to that day. Jesus, we look forward to when you come back. And we serve you with no sin and no troubles and no messes. But between now and that day, I pray that you would strengthen us to continue to serve you. And we will live among your people with different personalities. Mr. Assertive and Mr. Encouragement, all, all of us all together. Disagreeing on stuff. And we'll serve you in the midst of that until it's done. And I pray you would help us to be faithful to you. We thank you for the gospel, that you would forgive us of our sins, that we can then show grace to other people. And that you take sin seriously, and so we take other people's sin seriously too, and we take our own sin seriously, and we, we follow after you, and we realize we follow after you in, in a mess right now, but not forever. And so I just ask for your strength and your perseverance, especially for, I, I bet, I'm just guessing there are some people in this room that like individually right now need your, like your comfort and your like keep going on perseverance. And so we ask for that. And we love you and we thank you for the gospel and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let me end with these good words from God's word. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 it says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. That is good news.